Hello and a very warm welcome to all our friends to another episode of A Dialogue with History. I'm Achish and I'm standing over one of my favorite hangouts, Delhi Hut. If you're wondering where Mamta is, your guess is as good as mine. I can bet she's somewhere close by shopping. Hi friends. Hi Ashish. Hello. See what I've bought? Wow. A pair of earrings. Where did you find them? A few shops down. There's some quite exquisite and ethnic jewelry here. Did you know that jewelry can help us to recreate the history of a particular era? What are you talking about? Humans have always been very fond of decorating themselves to look better. This is particularly true in the Indian context. As a result, innumerable patterns and styles have emerged out of metals and stones. This has helped us to recreate the history of how the people lived in the bygone era. I would like to add here that the oldest civilization in the world, the Indus Valley civilization, had great love for jewelry. And this has given us a great insight on how the people of Harappan culture lived. Take a look. The art and technique of jewelry making in Harappan culture has garnered a lot of interest. Archaeological explorations at Mohenjo-daro and other sites of the Indus Valley civilization have unearthed a wealth of ornaments. Jewelry worn by both men and women, made in gold, silver, copper, ivory, bone and terracotta, precious and semi-precious stones has been found. The Indus civilization was among the world's earliest civilizations and geographically it was spread over an area of some 12,60,000 square kilometers. According to current evidence, Harappan settlements have been found in Mumbai, Delhi, the Iranian border and also in the Himalayas. At its peak, it may have had a population of well over 5 million and most had a love for jewelry. Some of the biggest heasts have been from the town of Mohenjo-daro. Though a large amount of gold jewelry has also been found from other areas such as Western Uttar Pradesh region of Muzaffarnagar and other sites in India. Fillets, ear studs, armlets, chokers, forehead ornaments, girdles, necklaces, bangles and wristlets have been found from all over the Harappan sites. Some of the pieces were so typical like these ear studs and bangles that till date they are easily identifiable with the Harappan age. Jewelry made of beads, semi-precious stones such as garnets, metals, gold, silver and alloys has been found. Interestingly, in some pieces, the craftsmen have combined the use of both precious and non-precious stones. Jewelry had commercial significance as extremely tiny weights and measures have been found. They are so small in size and weight that they can be used for nothing else other than weighing precious metals and stones. Jewelry tells us a lot about the likes and dislikes, typical patterns and interesting information about a civilization and therefore is of great importance to a historian. In the case of the Harappan civilization, pieces of evidence such as these 
clubbed with other historical evidence such as pottery, seals, toys, implements and remains of the many Harappan cities become all the more important. Particularly because till date the written script of Harappan is yet to be deciphered. Pieces of jewellery have been found during excavations at the many Harappan sites. When similar pieces are found in far off places, they tell us of the geographical extent of the civilization. The type of raw materials that have been used tell us about the technological conditions in that day and age. For example, we know that they could separate some metals from their ores. They could beat and mold them into different and attractive shapes and sizes. The use of raw materials also throws light on the trade links between one area and the other. For example, most of the raw material, such as gold, was not locally available. Yet, indigenous manufacture tells us that gold was imported as a raw material. Evidence of trade links with other civilizations, such as Mesopotamia, are also confirmed as crafted pieces of Harappan jewelry have been found in Mesopotamia. This itself speaks about the temperament of the people affinity towards good things in life and the modern outlook that they must have had. In fact, most of the things are in style and fashion, in vogue too. Some of the pieces are quite exquisite. In fact, you know Ashish, I want to show you something. Wow. Look at this terracotta necklace. Doesn't it look as if it's been inspired by the Harappan culture? You never know. Some traditions never change, and as women used to adorn jewellery to beautify themselves, there was a series of traditional and tribal art forms that were used to beautify the walls of houses or religious and social structures. One such extremely popular tradition is that of Madhubani paintings. We all have heard of them. We all must have bought them. But how many of us actually know where they had come from? How old is the tradition? And how did they evolve into such a popular art form? And these very facts find a mention in our next section on art and culture. Madhubani paintings are popularly identified as ceremonial folk paintings from the land of Mithila in northern Bihar. Mithila encompasses present districts Saharsa, Muzaffarpur, Vaishali, Darbhanga, Madhubani, Samastipur, parts of Mongaya, Begusarai, Bhagalpur and Purnia. Madhubani town is the most important site of these paintings and therefore, this stream of paintings is popularly known as Madhubani paintings or Mithila art. It is generally believed by the people of that era that Mithila was first to be brought under the influence of Aryan culture. In fact, Tulsidas gave a vivid account of how Mithila was decorated for the marriage of Sita with Ram. And these very traditions in decoration are elaborately depicted in these paintings. But over a period of time, the religious themes got divided into two branches, namely the little tradition and the great tradition. The little tradition depicts local gods and icons, such as Raja Sailesh and goddesses like Reshma, Kusma and Jutki Malini. 
in the little tradition, the main focus remains on stories of Raja Sailesh, who's the chief god of the people of Madhubani. The great tradition depicts chief Hindu gods and goddesses like Ram, Sita, Radha Krishna, Mahadev Parvati, Durga, Kali, Ganesh, Sun, Moon and Navagraha. Village scenes, animals, birds and flowers are also found on Madhubani paintings. Symbols of fertility and prosperity like fish, parrot, elephant, turtle, sun, moon, bamboo are more prominent. The human figures are mostly abstract and linear in form. The animals are usually naturalistic and are invariably depicted in profile. It is made with the flow of the brush without any preliminary sketching. Tattoo symbols are also an important part of these paintings. To this day, the Maithils take pride in their continuity of language, customs and culture. Women and villages mainly create these paintings. The technique and style is passed from one generation to another. Initially, the paintings were mainly depicted on walls and it was chiefly a decorative art. These wall paintings also had a ritual functionality and were a part of the wedding ceremonies. About 50 to 60 years ago, all of this changed and the artists were inspired to commercialize their art by making it onto other media as well. Today, Madhubani paintings are made on walls, paper, cloth, religious and decorative pots, and sometimes on wood. For painting on paper, they use natural colors and natural powders, which are locally abstracted. On walls and cloth, they use fabric colors. In the beginning, Homemade natural colors were obtained from plant extracts like henna leaves, bougainvillea, neem, etc. These natural juices were mixed with raisin from banana leaves and ordinary gum in order to make the paint stick to the painting medium. Homemade paints though cheap, were time-consuming and produced less than the requirement. The solution was to switch to colors available aplenty in the market. Now colors come in powdered form, which are then mixed with gum. However, black continues to be obtained from the soot deposits by the flame of dea dissolved in gum. The colors are usually bright and are almost always outlined in black. There are three schools of Madhupani. The first prefers the very bright hues, while the others opt for muted ones. In the third school of painting, handmade paper is washed in cow dung. Once the paints are ready, two kinds of brushes are used. One made out of bamboo twigs for the tiny details and the other for filling in the spaces. Today, most artists use fountain pens. The Madhubani people totally rely on this art for their living. It is an art known far and wide and a tradition that has survived and thrived.
I truly like the tradition of Madhubani paintings. They are so colourful and rich. Interestingly, the colours themselves have specific meanings. What is really interesting is the fact that the change of medium from walls to paper had a lot to do with the popularisation of the art. That leads me to think of the importance of paper in our lives. Really, it can turn things around. Yes, and did you know that the printing paper in the form of printing machine was a bigger invention? That is why we have come to the printing press to know more about the printing. If not better, at least a big leap in the era of the paper, books and education. So let us take a look at the invention and the subsequent spread of printing in the world. The process of paper printing was developed independently in China and Europe. Before the invention of printing, multiple copies of a manuscript had to be made by hand, a laborious task that could take many years. Printing made it possible to produce more copies in a few weeks than formerly could have been produced in a lifetime by hand. It also improved the shelf life of the books as the inks lasted far longer. Invented by a German named Johannes Gutenberg in 1456 AD, the printing press made the mass publication and circulation of literature possible. The first printing press used a heavy screw to force a printing block against the paper below. The invention of the printing press, in turn, set off a social revolution that is still in progress. Once developed, printing spread rapidly and began to replace hand-printed texts for a wider readership. The most important fallout of this was the availability of the written material to the common man. The printing press stoked intellectual fires at the end of the Middle Ages, helping usher in an era of enlightenment. This great cultural rebirth was inspired by widespread access to and appreciation for literature and classical art, and these translated into a renewed passion for artistic and literary expression. In fact, printing press is considered an important component of the Renaissance. What civilization gained from Gutenberg's invention is incalculable. In 1814, the Times of London introduced the first steam press for printing. Other technological innovations followed soon that helped increase the ease with which a page could be typeset. Together, these new methods of mass production helped pave the way to the growth of a mass reading public a public which finally wrested literature from the closed circles of the educated and wealthy. The first printing press in India seems to have been brought by the Portuguese in the 1550s to Goa for printing records for official use. Though the first printing press to be imported to India was done by a Parsi businessman, Bhimji Parikh, in 1670. The Bengali newspaper Sangbad Comedy, published from Calcutta, is considered by many to be the first Indian newspaper. The oldest newspaper that is still under print is the Mumbai Samachar. It was a vernacular newspaper published in Mumbai. Since then, Indian media has enjoyed considerable freedom and is steadily increasing circulation despite threats from other media such as television and radio. Printing is perhaps one of the better inventions. Don't you agree? Yes, it goes without saying. Just look around. 
How many people can begin a day without prepping a hot cup of tea or coffee and a newspaper? That is so true. In fact, in my house, there's a virtual scramble for the morning newspaper. So we should all thank Mr. Guttenberg and also our viewers who took time to watch our program. So until next time, it is a goodbye from the whole team of A Dialogue with History. Goodbye.